For years now, we've been told that the optical disc is dead. Chances are your current computer doesn't even have an optical drive. But what if you're a collector with a bunch of DVDs or Blu-ray discs sitting on a shelf somewhere? What if you're like me, a fan of music from around the world that's not legally available for download at all? How do you get this stuff that you already legally own onto your phones, tablets, and laptops without either paying for it yet again or resorting to piracy? Well, there is good news because it's both free and easy. Well, pretty easy. All it takes is two small utilities, and I'll walk you through where and how to get them and how to use them in this video. First, though, if you don't have one already, you are going to need an aftermarket optical drive to read the raw disk data and dump it into your computer. Blu-ray drives are a bit more expensive than DVD drives, and external drives more expensive than internal. You'll have to match up the drive you buy with the media you need to rip, and if you have a desktop, I do recommend an internal drive for speed and cost. Laptop owners don't have much choice, you'll need an external drive. But there are plenty of both to choose from on sites like Newegg.com. Now the first application you need is Make MKV. As you can see here, it is in beta. It's a very stable beta. It's been in beta for years. I'm not sure when or if it's ever going to come out of beta. As long as it is in beta, it is free. So go ahead and download this. You click the download link here or here. Uh, you have it here for both Windows and the Mac OS, so get whichever one you need. And uh, once you have that, you're going to need to actually get the registration key from the forum. So click on the forum link there, news and announcements, and click on this Make MKV is free while in beta. Uh, this code changes every month or two, so depending on how long it's been since you've started to Make MKV the last time, you might have to get a new code. But it's always there. You just go and get the new one. Uh, once you've started Make MKV Beta, just click Help, Register, and you'll paste the code in there. You'll need to then restart the program, and you'll be good to go. Now, what does Make MKV actually do? Well, this is the application that takes the data that's on your disks and transfers it over to your, to your computer. And what you end up with is an MKV file. That's a Matroshka file, spelled Matroshka, pronounced Matroshka. And it is a lossless transfer, so it's changing the file container, it's changing it into an MKV file from the transport stream or whatever it is on the disk. But it's not changing the data, so the actual uh, picture quality that you end up with and the audio will be completely the same as the original. So no worries about that at all. Um, so once you have that MKV file, you can then do whatever you want with it. You can just leave it as is. Many players, such as VLC, will play it just fine. Or you can compress it, and that's probably what you're going to want to do if you're going to put the file on your tablet or phone or whatever. And I'll talk about that once we're done with Make MKV here. But using Make MKV is quite simple. Uh, when you first boot it up, or start it up, there's only a couple things you might want to change. One of those is the video destination. Um, you can change this later also, but the default is here, and you can change that if you want. And there's also a uh, data directory. I don't know. You may want to change that, but probably not. Um, so let me cancel out of this. And then I've already loaded a disk in here, so it's already recognized that information. It does take a few seconds. Press this giant icon here to open it. It's again going to take a few seconds to sort of figure out what's going on and uh, start to decrypt the disk. And here we have the data for the disk. This one happens to be in one title, which is good. That means all the, of the uh, files on the disk will end up in one big file on your hard drive. Um, sometimes you'll get multiple titles on a disk. You can join them together or leave them separate. I usually leave them separate because it's usually the main movie or whatever it is and then bonus material is separate and I like to keep those things separate so you you might often see more than one title here just let it do what it wants um, unless you want to join them together but uh, this is all set up ready to go so I'm just gonna click make MKV and that's gonna take the data on the disk and dump it onto my hard drive now it does take a while to rip a full Blu-ray disc especially, so you're probably going to want to just get yourself a cup of coffee or something in the meantime, but as you see here, ours has now finished. Copy complete, one title saved, and you hear, you see that down here in my folder of BDs to Crunch. Uh, you're probably going to want to rename this if you didn't already in, uh, in the file dialog earlier, 
So I'm just going to call it uh, handle perfect world. In fact, you see I already have a folder up there because I've already done this one. So now we have our MKV here and we can move on to the next step. And the next step is an app called Handbrake. Handbrake is an app that transcodes your video and compresses it. It turns it into a format and a file size that a tablet, a phone, or any other device can handle. And it'll do so while maintaining pretty good picture quality. In fact, it's really up to you how much you want to compress your video. So go to handbrake.fr, click the big download handbrake button, and it installs just like any other app. I don't believe for this one that you need any sort of registration code. So just download it, start it up, and it's going to look like this when you start it up. Uh, actually, it's going to look even more blank than this. I've already sort of preloaded stuff here, but what you're going to want to do is select your source. It's going to give you this dialog. We just created a file, so we're going to open a single file. This is our file that we just created. It's going to automatically fill in the destination field. If you want to change that, go ahead and change it. Make sure that you've got the right title selected and all your chapters, which they should be by default. Uh, leave container set on MP4. Uh, some players will play MKV, but MP4 is more compatible. You probably don't need web optimized. You probably don't need iPod 5G support unless you are encoding for an iPod fifth generation. As far as picture issues, uh, this tab here is a little bit tricky because Handbrake does try to sort of leave out things that it it doesn't think are real picture information. Now I happen to know that there definitely are 42 pixels worth of picture information on the left side of this DVD. So I know the handbrake is not cropping this correctly. So I'm going to take this off automatic and I'm going to set that at least to zero. But I also don't really like the way that it automatically crops the letterbox bars out. Now it doesn't do a bad job of this. It usually does. Um, I mean, it sometimes goes over by 10 or 20 pixels, I've found, when it crops the letterbox bars out. That's what this top and bottom crop is designed to do, because theoretically you don't want to have just a bunch of black encoded in your final video. And if you can get rid of that, that's great. Um, I'm not trying to save every byte that I can. I'm just trying to get these files small enough that they will comfortably fit on any tablet or phone and that's what I'm trying to teach you guys how to do also. So I'm actually going to take the safe route which is what I usually do and I'm going to set all of the cropping to zero. That will give me, uh, once I've set this, that will give me a file that is exactly the same dimensions as my original file. Blu-ray discs, it's going to tell you here the source is usually going to be 1920 by 1080 DVDs can be a little tricky because they are smaller uh, smaller dimensions, but they can be anamorphic. Uh, Blu-ray discs, I don't believe they're ever anamorphic. Uh, somebody's probably going to prove me wrong in the comments. but So I always, with Blu-ray discs, I turn anamorphic to none because you don't need it. Uh, DVDs, you can, I mean, you can look up how these work. It's, it's again, this is not particularly user-friendly, but... Uh, with Blu-ray discs, you can comfortably leave it on none. Filters, similarly with a Blu-ray disc, you probably don't need any of them on. Uh, I have seen Blu-ray discs that are interlaced. So in those cases, what you want is to actually use decomb, not deinterlace. Decomb works better, and you want to set it to default, not to custom, not to fast or bob, default. What that does is allow handbrake to analyze the video itself and only apply decombing where it's needed because decombing does actually affect the picture just a little bit. So uh, that's what you do if you happen to see interlacing in, say, your preview that you're going to do before you actually make your final video. I'm going to leave this off right now. Sorry, I didn't mean to click that. Just meant to click off. Everything off because I know this Blu-ray disc uh, is progressive, does not need any sort of deinterlacing or any of these other filters here. Most of these filters you would probably use on a DVD 
or if you're trying to make a really small file size um, and then you would you typically end up with some noise which you might want to then denoise you'd end up with some blocks which you might want to then de block you don't need any of that with a blu-ray disc now the video tab again not particularly user friendly although there is also an advanced tab that you don't need to use if you just do everything here and once you know what's going on in here it's pretty simple to just use the same settings or similar settings over and over video codec uh, the best one to use right now is still h264 you see h265 is in here that takes forever to transcode and it is also not particularly compatible with a lot of players right now so keep it on h264 frame rate i like to keep same as source uh, variable constant it doesn't really matter if you're doing a blu-ray it's gonna it's gonna pretty much stay constant anyway optimized video now the x264 preset you want to keep as slow as you can deal with. Uh, depending on the speed of your PC, this can be extremely slow. But remember, you're encoding one file and you're going to have that file for the rest of your life. So unless you do it again, which you're probably not going to want to do. So I keep this on very slow, which is just above placebo. Uh, placebo really <laughs> is what it says. Very slow is sort of going to be the best quality at the smallest file size that you can get and it does take quite a while so be prepared even with a fast machine to let this sit overnight now x264 tune i usually leave this on none again you don't really need it on a blu-ray disc you might benefit maybe on a dvd in some cases fast decode i actually have a, an older tv stick at my job and I sometimes leave this turned on for that because um, if the device that you are encoding for does have a very slow CPU then it can benefit from fast decode now it does affect the picture quality pretty greatly um, fast decode degrades things a lot so I try to leave it off but if you do have a slow CPU on whatever you're encoding for you might need to have that on x264 profile again uh, it, it it's probably best to leave this on auto. Um, I usually leave it on high and H.264. You want to try to leave on 4.1 or above if you can. Again, older devices might need to have these set differently. The TV stick at my job, I need to set this to baseline and I need to set this to three. So again, that determines the sort of encoding features that are available to the software and it will not use the more advanced features if you set these to lower levels. As far as quality goes, you can leave it on constant quality 20, which is the, um, that's the default. I would preview that and see what it looks like. I usually don't use the quality settings at all. I use bitrate. I find that it results in better quality and smaller file sizes. And when, if I'm doing a 1080p Blu-ray, which generally works fine on any recent Android tablet, on any iPad, iPhone, any Android phone, and of course any laptop, I put it on 2500 kilobits, two-pass encoding, and Turbo First Pass works just fine. Um, it doesn't need to do a full first pass. Turbo First Pass just gives it that little extra analysis that will help it then on the second pass. So that's basically the settings that I use. Now you can use these profiles over here instead. I find these pretty useless, mostly because they're extremely old. For example, the Android tablet preset only gives you a 720p file, so you're gonna have to adjust things anyway. So I just do it all manually, but again, I've done this a bunch of times now, and I know what I'm doing, and this is pretty much the settings that I use every time. Now, audio is usually going to be okay as it is. Subtitles, unless you have a subtitle file, you don't need to worry about it. Uh, chapters, same thing. Make sure create chapter markers is set to on and advanced you don't need to worry about. That's it. Basically everything's set at this point. If you want to, you can save this preset down here. The thing is, it 
I've discovered it doesn't always save everything. You still have to go through and make sure everything is set properly. For example, it usually does not save the picture size. I always have to change that. Now, once this is done, uh, I would hit preview and just take a look. You can you can preview for five seconds and get a good idea. These preview positions here just go to different parts of the file so you can see what different parts look at. Every video is going to be a little different at different points. There's going to be more or less going on. So you want to check this at a couple different locations. I'm going to start that now. I'm probably going to have to turn the sound down and I might even have to just show you a still uh, just to sort of head off the YouTube copyright police. So let me do this. It does take a few seconds, so I'll, I'll cut in here and I'll be right back. Now your preview is going to come up in VLC Media Player if you happen to have it, and I do recommend it. Otherwise, it'll use your system default player. I'm just showing you a still here again to keep my video from being flagged, but I've watched all five seconds of this and it looks great. Now, if I was going to do this again, I would just go ahead and encode right from here. Uh, this is like a cooking show. I've prepared one earlier, so I don't need to do this again, but this looks good to me. It looks pretty much indistinguishable from the original, and I just want to talk a little bit about bit rates again and picture quality. Now, I said earlier I usually set 2500 kbps, and to me, on a 1080p Blu-ray disc, that ends up usually looking indistinguishable from the original. Uh, you may not mind having a little more compression. Some people might think 2500 is way high. I personally think it's way low. It's a lot more compression than Blu-rays use to begin with. But if you're okay with having some artifacts, with having a little lower resolution, please be my guest. Try setting the bitrate lower and try setting the picture size lower. Um, you will save some disk space and you'll be able to pack more video files onto whatever device you're using. I personally just like to have things that look just like the original, so th these are the settings that I use. Now if you're doing a DVD, bitrate is going to be a little different. I usually use, I think, somewhere between 1000 and 1500. Now that might also seem high. You can get away with less. But something about DVDs and the fact that there's so much more noise and JPEG artifacting to begin with, I feel like if you go below that, much below that at least, you end up with even more artifacting than you otherwise would get. Blu-rays have kind of a cleaner image to begin with, so the bitrate doesn't need to scale up quite the same way. You can get away with a, a few fewer bits per sort of pixel of resolution with a Blu-ray disc than with a DVD in my experience. So anyway, let's go ahead and encode from here. Uh, we're ready to go. The preview looks good. Everything is set up. So what you want to do here is click Add to Queue. You can just click Start, but if you do Add to Queue, it's going to let you do other things in the meantime. So you Add to Queue, and if we just then click Show Queue, it should be there. Here's our job. It's ready to go. And we can now click start from here and just let it crunch on that. Now, this is going to take a while, depending on how you've set it up, especially if you use the very slow preset like I have. Um, it's It could take all night, depending on your computer. Um, mine here says it's going to take approximately, well, this is going to keep going up for a little while. So let's say this is going to take an hour and 45 minutes. That's for pass one. Pass 2 is going to have its own clock. So I figure this is probably going to take a good 4 or 5 hours. So I'm not going to show you the whole process. But while this is happening, you can do other things with your computer. One thing about Handbrake is, especially on the first pass, it doesn't generally max out the CPU. And uh, let me show you that right now. So here's the Windows Resource Monitor next to Handbrake, and you can see exactly how Handbrake is using the CPU. I have an 8-core CPU in this machine, and it's actually doing a pretty good job this time. We're up about 80% CPU usage. Oftentimes, especially on the first pass, if you have any sort of filters set or if you change the picture size or uh, set fast to code or any of these things, many of those tasks 
those subroutines, I guess, in Handbrake are not particularly well optimized for a multi-core CPU. So you might sometimes see, depending on how you set it up, the CPU usage down around 20%. Now, usually on the second pass, it goes up to 100% and stays there. So at that point, you probably want to stop using your C your computer. But even at this point, even with 80% CPU, CPU usage, I feel comfortable continuing to use my computer. I don't notice any slowdowns or anything like that, and it doesn't seem to really slow down the job itself. Now, of course, you can continue to add on more jobs to Handbrake if you have more disks that you want to do. You can even rip more disks using Make MKV while this is going on. It's not really going to affect anything. You can just keep adding jobs here to the queue. Um, they'll just appear under here and it'll just move on to the next one once it finishes the, the one before. When it's completely done with everything, you can have it suspend as I usually do because I'm usually away from the computer at that point or do nothing or do any of these other things. Now when Handbrake is finished, you're going to end up with a file that looks like this one. This is the one that I prepared earlier using the same settings. And you see 2 hours and 17 minutes, and it's 2.9 gigabytes. If you can get between 1 and 1.5 gigabytes per hour, you're doing pretty well, I think. And that's probably the goal that I shoot for. You can see some of these, if you look closely, I did better or worse depending on the disk. Some disks require less compression. There's more going on, and some of them you can get away with more. That's all just down to experimentation. You preview a bunch of times, change the settings until you find something you like. But anyway, so we have this file that we made and now we want to get it onto one of our devices. So here I have my Samsung Galaxy Tab S and all I need is the USB cable that it came with. Now, Android tablet and phone file transfers are extremely easy iOS is a little harder to deal with, and it's kind of out of the scope of this video, but uh, I'll, I'll tell you what you need to do is get VLC player for the iPad or iPhone, and then transfer files through VLC. I've done it before. It's kind of a convoluted process. I'm not going to show it here because I'm doing this on a PC, and I don't have a Mac to do it with right now, but uh, that's basically how you do it. On a Windows PC connected to an Android tablet, all you do is drag and drop. This is my Galaxy Tab S. It's connected through the USB cable to my computer right now. I just navigate to whatever folder I want. I keep all of this stuff on my Movies SD card, and all I do is drag this right over and copy it. I'm not going to do it right now because it's already there, but, uh, well, why not? Let's see. Copy here. And no, just copy. Never convert and copy. Just copy. And copy and replace. Okay. It's already there, but uh, here it goes. It's going to take a little while um, over a USB connection, but eventually you will have a file on the tablet. So here's the file that we just made and transferred playing on my tablet. I've muted the sound, and hopefully that, combined with the small size of the video itself, will put off the YouTube police. But at this point, you're basically good to go. You take the file that you just transferred, load it up in your player of choice on your device, and that's pretty much it. And the process, of course, works the same for any other phone or tablet, or if you're doing this just to keep on your laptop, you don't have to do the transfer part at all. You're pretty much done as soon as the encode is done. So that's it. I hope you've enjoyed this look at how to transfer your Blu-ray discs over to your tablets or phones or other devices. I'll try and do some more how-to videos like this in the future, but I hope you got something out of this one, and I'll see you next time. Thanks.